ready? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Landon Zackheim. I am the interactive programmer for the Denver Film Festival, and uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's panel on the future of content. Thanks so much for joining us here at the 40th Annual Denver Film Festival. Um, I'm going to let everybody here introduce themselves in just a moment, but what we've done today is assembled a panel of content creators in various different forms that might be uh, termed Various things you may have heard, like transmedia, new media, immersive theater, virtu we have virtual reality artists on here. Uh, but what we're going to be talking about is the convergence of either technologies and forms to um, create a sense of storytelling beyond what we see kind of in cinematic, traditional cinematic mediums. Uh, and this is going to kind of go over a broad range of topics because we have people working in a bunch of different disciplines here. Uh, and so we'll discuss kind of what they do. Uh, some of the trends that we're seeing uh, in forms today, what the future of content actually means to these different creators, uh, and then we'll take some questions for you. So first, I'd love everybody to just introduce themselves and just quickly mention kind of the project or affiliation you have uh, with the festival or the area. Hi, my name is Stephen Shard. I wrote and direct Auto, which is an 11 minute 360 video VR piece. Uh, it's a story. It's about an Ethiopian immigrant who gets hired as a safety driver for an autonomous car company. So this is like two or three minutes in the future. Um, and it's a narrative where uh, you are a passive participant. You can look around, but uh, there's no it within the story. Uh, so it's more like a film. I'm Lauren Ludwig. I'm the director and writer of an immersive theater experience that's here at the festival called Red Flags. Uh, which is an hour and 15 minute experience where one audience member goes on a fictional first date with an actor uh, who is in character as a woman named Emma. Uh, and the entity that made that show uh, is my theater company, Capital W, which I'm one of the two founders of. We're based in Los Angeles. I'm Monica Miklas. I'm the creative producer and dramaturg of Capital W. I'm Lauren's producing partner. And I think she summed up our story pretty well. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, oh, am I on? Yes. My name is Charlie Miller, and I will live here in Denver and work at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. I'm an associate artistic director, and I oversee our off-center line of programming. And over the past five plus years, we've been developing and producing um, large-scale immersive work in Denver. I think the one that probably got on the map the most uh, two years ago was Sweet and Lucky in a warehouse on Brighton Boulevard. And we recently closed the production of The Wild Party that was an immersive musical that we built out in an airplane hangar at the Stanley uh, Marketplace. So, immersive theater. <laughs> Hey, I am Teal Greyhavens. I'm head of content for a company called Dark Corner. We are a virtual reality content studio and also distribution platform. And uh, I'm here with our newest piece that we made in-house, which is called Night Night. Um, it's a short virtual reality uh, live action experience. Um, and we, everything that we do is in the genre space, which essentially, mean, essentially means horror and then some or sci-fi, thriller, all that kind of stuff. Um, yep. That's it. All right, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and now, and we'll start back with you, Teal, and go the other way. Mm -hmm. um, can you each give us a sense of how you got into what you're doing and just sort of the evolution of where you are now? Sure, yeah, we, um, we've been around, in, when you're talking in terms of virtual reality, the new wave of virtual reality. We've been around about since the dawn of time, which is three years ago. We made a, uh, a piece called Catatonic, um, which at the time was one of the first kind of live action horror pieces that found some, some traction in the emerging VR world. And, um, and it kind of pointed the way to what we've now become because the response was really strong. And um, there's this question in, in VR and, and a lot of sort of emerging media of like, who is it for? Like, who, who's gonna watch this stuff? And what we found uh, was that the horror space works really well for um, people who might otherwise not necessarily, uh, you know, be into emerging tech and all those kinds of uh, fancy words that people like us might be into. And so um, there was a lot of, 
the, the, the reactions were really great and Dark Corner was started and I um, met the director around the time of Catatonic and we basically built this little studio together. Um, not really having any idea of, of what it could become, but since then we've really worked hard to make strides towards something resembling a business model, <laughs> which is uh, a strange concept in VR uh, these days, but um, yeah, we're, we're trying to build something that, you know, will resemble uh, the, the, the sort of content studio structures that we know from movies that will work for the future. So my background is as a theater artist and filmmaker, um, and I combined those things in video design, which I did for a number of years at the Denver Center. And early on, I was really interested in having a lab space where we could be experimenting with different types of technologies and how they might um, inspire new theatrical experiences. And, and it really started for me when I was in college thinking about how the internet can be an extension of the theatrical experience, where a show about YouTube could have YouTube videos online that you could interact with, and therefore the story was, uh, those made you interested in seeing the show and also extended the show when you were done. And so, and then when I saw Sleep No More um, in 2009, I think, that really opened my eyes, as it did many people who were experiencing it for the first time in America, to the possibilities of taking theater outside a conventional space making it a 360 degree experience and giving the audience agency in that experience. And so I really come at it from those two places. Uh, I am a theater artist as well. Um, my whole career producing theater has been spent in new work. And so devising and uh, collaborative writing processes are something that I've been involved with um, since college. And a few years ago, Lauren and I started talking, uh, we first started talking about wanting to do a production of Hamlet. And we were trying to figure out, like, you know, this is such a classic play, what's our stamp on it? And around the same time, both started hearing about immersive theater, started hearing about Sleep No More, uh, which I still haven't seen, <laughs> full disclosure. Um, and, and then we just, it, these things all started coming together and then came together in our first production, which was called Hamlet Mobile, which was a Hamlet in a converted cargo van, which was great. Um, so maybe Lauren can talk a little bit more about, about that part of the story. Um, and since then, we've really focused on uh, ways of telling stories that are very intimate and how do we create an experience for every audience member that um, feels the same as sort of that coveted one-on-one -on -one moment um, that people are always lusting after in immersive. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I started as a straight theater artist, though I really have always done site-specific work, uh, which is sort of one of the precursor terms before immersive. Um, it was always in these non-traditional environments, but it was never participatory, and there was still always an implied fourth wall. Um, and I eventually got bored of that, um, and I started to get more interested in filmmaking. Um, and something I started loving about filmmaking was how it really took all of my brain and body and soul. It's so wonderfully challenging. And I started to get excited about coming back to theater, but doing something that was much more ambitious and logistically challenging, and um, eventually got to more interactive. Um, more participatory, um, and uh, that led to the immersive theater work we do now in Capital W. Yeah, and our first production, Hamlet Mobile, uh, was basically this series of eight short experiences, each of just about 15 minutes, that were all riffs on different characters, themes, or scenes in Hamlet. And this van, the Hamlet Mobile, as we called it, would drive around Los Angeles and park for like two or three hours of a, at a time, and do one of those little scenes on a loop. Um, kind of like a food truck, actually, essentially, but with theater. Um, and so you could just see one of the pieces, you could see three, you could see all eight. It was about kind of breaking out the story um, and making it more of a collage that you put together yourself in whatever order you happen to catch the pieces. Um, and if you collected all eight, you got a free bumper sticker. Um, <laughs> this is very automobile-focused production. Um, so yeah, so uh, and then we're just continually interested in expanding how we can be telling stories and giving visceral, very emotion-driven experiences to our audiences. 
Um, I, am, as I said before, I have been making uh, VR pieces. Um, I made a, the short film that I am showing here is a near future science fiction, but more in the sense of a, like a, the very first science fiction. Nope. Um. <laughs> um, so it's a bit of a return to uh, I'm going to start okay. over. <laughs> um, so um, so auto is a it's a science fiction set very near in the future, but it's about an, what is an imminent technology. So I'm interested in taking a look at how technologies affect, um, how, affect our lives. And um, the, the piece that I've done basically assumes that we're living in a world where automated cars exist, and it exists in a sort of trans, transformational moment where a uh, real human um, like Uber in Pittsburgh uh, hires what they call safety engineers to sit in the front seat. So someone is essentially like sort of automating themselves out of a, out of a job. So interested in taking a look at um, <clears throat> how technology is uh, impacting culture and what better way than with VR, uh, a future media. So uh, before we go any further, uh, I do want to ask: Has uh, who in the audience has? has never either done a virtual reality or immersive theater or interactive piece? Like, who, is this new for anybody? Oh, a couple of you, great. Um, okay, um, that is very good to know. Then uh, I'd love to ask each of you, and anybody who wants to jump in can start, uh, why did each of your pieces, like why do they need to be interactive? Why did your, why does Night Night have to be a virtual reality piece as opposed to a short film or another term. Why can't Otto be a film? Why can't um, your pieces be straight theater? Why can't you put on you know, theater? What, what is it that makes the immersive aspect of it an inherent part of the show? Yeah, dude, thank you so much for asking that. <laughs> um, we, so, so my role at Dark Corner is, uh, as I say, I help to create stuff that we make in-house like Night Night, but then also curate things for the platform, so I watch a lot of VR content, and that's the number one thing that... I, don't, I, won't, I won't say that, like, I'll take off the headset before a piece is done, but the number one thing that it just makes you go, oh, as soon as I start watching something is when there's no reason for it to be in VR. And I think that's a thing that happens a lot, unfortunately, is people sort of, they have a good idea for you know, a short film or, you know, like a, like a movie and then just do it in VR and it, it immediately, there's a, there's a lack of interest in the 360 space that is immediately sort of palpable. Um, the pieces that we have made so far, um, all the way back from Catatonic that I mentioned, which is Catatonic is like you're in a wheelchair, it's POV and you're being pushed through a, an insane asylum um, in like the 50s. And all of our pieces are literally first-person POV, so like you look down and you see your body, and then you can you know, look around from there, and you're, you're a character in the story, although in the case of these ones, you, don't, you usually don't have very much agency, which is sort of built into the, the concept. Um, and that is 100% something that you can't do in, in 2D. I mean, you, we, there's POV experiences, Hardcore Henry, people like to talk about a couple of years ago, but it's... It's, there's nothing that matches having a body but then having the agency as though you were that person to look around in the story. And that's, that's a big part of our entree. I mean, we have other pieces on our platform that are not POV, but that still just, you have to use that 360 space. Um, and, uh, you know, and these guys can talk about when there's real people involved. I mean, it's, it's so different from going to the movies, and it has to be. Do either of you want to jump in on kind of Is this one working pieces? again? Oh, yes. Great. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, no. No. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to permanently. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, for us. Oh, no. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's we know what the common factor body. is here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to, I'll just kind of 
Yeah, okay. I'll just, uh, could everybody pass all the microphones over to me? Okay, right. Okay, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, uh, so for us, like, so for example, in the show that we have here at the festival, Red Flags, um, that's a show that it does have a script, but also has huge space for improvisation, because if you as an audience member are going on this fictional first date, we wanted it to feel like a real first date, which means you're talking the whole time, and you're offering up a lot of yourself, and the person you're on the date with, this character of Emma, is asking you questions about yourself, like you do with somebody on a real first date, right? It kind of follows that social script and then starts to deviate from it. So. For, that's such, such so, so participatory. I mean, in a way, you are creating about 40% of the script as an audience member. So there just isn't a normal theater equivalent of that, right? So that's kind of obviously needs to be immersive. Uh, but then there, you know, this is a debate within the community. There are immersive shows that have no responsiveness to the audience, but they're still called immersive. And in that way, what they are, they're just shows that sort of happen in a 3D environment, real life, around the audience. Um, but they're not necessarily interactive in any way. And some people in the immersive community feel like that's a waste of the form, and other people say, shut up, I can make whatever art I want, and that's probably more how I feel. Um, but I personally, uh, and really, I feel like, you can speak to this, but I feel like we're both on the same page about this. We like the shows to be responsive to you. We want you to feel like if you as an audience member hadn't shown up, the show had no reason to exist or happen without you. You were an intrinsic part of it. And that's what makes immersive theater interesting to us. Yeah. I will add that um, really the artistic question that I'm interested in investigating, and again, I feel I can speak for Lauren too, is I'm interested in art that asks something of the viewer. And, and to challenge this model of um, art being something that's going from A to B and you're just receiving, but really to fully experience that you have to give as well. I think there's something really beautiful and interesting in that. Um, I think a good example of that is that the second show we did uh, was called And the Drum. It was a staging of a book of poetry with dance in the home, in the home of the poet. And it was in all the rooms of her house, in her bedroom, on her bed, in the basement, on the roof. Um, but central to that show, amidst all this poetry and dance, was a dinner party. And it was really a dinner to the... They had... And they had an experience of, of sharing a meal together and then also being asked to tell stories during the meal. It was really incredible. And it, it, people are friends now because they saw that show together and then they develop these relationships during the course of the show, and we hear that they're hanging out and they're going to plays together. It's really, it's really incredible. So it's a form of kind of community building too. That's, yeah, that's exciting. Um, uh, Charlie, can you talk about why, you know, why the shows you put on, why is it so important that the Performing Arts Center uh, take part in this form? Well, um, I've been personally passionate about this work and I think the theater sees it as a way to engage a very new and different audience, and, and that has proven out. Um, in particular, with our work, we're focused on the millennial audience in Denver. Um, many of you probably know that Denver is a huge millennial hub, and um, a couple years ago, we had the largest percentage of millennials per capita, second largest in the country, second to DC. There's almost a million millennials living in the metro area, um, and the, the Denver Center really sees that as key to our future survival as uh, an organization and an art form, and that we've realized over the years that younger people aren't attending the theater the way that our parents and grandparents did, and we also are seeking out different types of cultural experiences and, and want different things out of a night out. And um, immersive theater seems to provide that in a lot of ways. It's often more social, um, or at least if it's individual, it gives you something to socialize about afterwards, which I think is another piece of it. Um, and we have found through this work that we are in fact moving the needle in terms of engaging millennial audiences, and there's a broad appeal for this work across generations, and there are lots of audiences of all ages who are really um, captivated by this work and who 
now that they've had a taste of it, want more and more. Um, so I think that answers your question. The other thing I would add, just to build on what you guys were saying, um, and, and having just produced a show that was originally written for a, a traditional Broadway proscenium stage and staging it in 360 degrees, um, the key, I think, in successful, immersive, or experiential work is that the audience is cast in a role and they have a role to play in the story um, and a reason to be there. And I think that gets at some of what you guys have, have spoken about, but in the case of The Wild Party, it was this party that was taking place and the audience was cast as a guest at the party. And so you immediately know the rules of engagement, you understand your relationship to the story and to the characters, you understand why you're in this room with these people. And even though it was less interactive than some of our other work, because you could play the role of, of guest, it, it suddenly created a context for the story and it enhanced the story that you were a part of. And same with you, Stephen. Why, why is Otto why, so unique to the virtual reality space? Why couldn't this be a narrative short film? Well, I do think that Otto could be a narrative short film in a sort of flat sense. Um, but I was working on a much larger science fiction series that has to do a lot with emerging tech. Um, and so telling this story, which is a near future story, I think implicates the viewer, or at least um, something that will happen and pu puts it in a more speculative mode um, rather than just something that you're watching. Yet also kind of, as part of the theme in the story, it puts you through multiple perspectives. So ideally when you come from, uh, VR has, a, has an ability to contextualize or like put you in a space. So in the progression of time in the story, five minutes you're spending with one character who's then thrust into a completely different context. Um, I think that the emotion, the, the emotional valence of like being in that experience is much more pronounced. And similarly, like just the, there, there are certain aspects about the story where you're sort of in a car um, where you're your, it's not necessarily your safety, but you are experiencing it as both the driver and, and the, the passengers. So it's, it's much less uh, that I'm coming at it, um, you know, I think, I think from a purist standpoint or from a really formal standpoint, but I also, it's also kind of, I hadn't seen any narratives that were done in VR that um, used more traditional story, storytelling techniques or filmmaking techniques. And I think we have a lot, you know, in order to do the next thing, we have to kind of do what we can with the grammar that we know. Because, um, you know, in early days of film, you know, we had single shots. People were very oriented uh, around thinking about where the camera was and playing actions toward the cameras. But it wasn't until, you know, 10 years into the advent of film that we kind of got cutting and close-ups and, and um, parallel editing and a lot more things that allowed us to tell stories, so a kind of narrator system. And that's, that's emergent now. I mean, like, we don't have, I mean, I could point to five things that kind of look like traditional films, you know, so. Yeah. Anyway. Now, at a tattoo, as a viewer, uh, it, there's something to be said about, there's a feeling of complicity while, in that you're wearing a, a headset while watching the human implications of technology on somebody else. You, you're sort of part of Yeah, it's not so much your, in my case, I, I don't describe it as immersion so much as implication. You know, you're implied in the narrative. Um, so it, I think VR is important to the story, but maybe it's not so central that it's vital, but it is, uh, it's very important. Uh, I should add that both Auto and Night Night are available downstairs all week along with a number of the other virtual reality experiences. Um, you all kind of touched on in different ways the concept of, of agency and the importance of agency in your work. Um, I, and again, anybody feel free to jump in first here. Uh, what, why, why do you think these audiences that are, are becoming attracted to your pieces and other pieces like this, why is agency so important to this emerging, emerging audience? And on top of that, and I know this is a longer answer, what are some of your techniques to help cultivate that agency? 
Shall I, shall I start no, again? No, go ahead, right. Teal. Um, no, I, it's funny. I, had, I actually had this little riff sort of locked and loaded from the last thing, which is that, and this is actually common to, it, so one of the things that I would say unites live immersive theater and VR is the agency or, or the possibility of agency on the audience's side. And a, a question, um, I mean, essentially the question that you asked that I think comes up a lot in VR is how do you, how do you control the audience's gaze? I think a lot of traditional directors kind of come at this with a tone of worry in their voice, like, wait, but, but I'm so used to controlling exactly what my audience sees. Like, what, what, what do I do? How do we do that? And, um, I, you know, I, I guess I just, I think that whenever I go to an immersive theater piece, I'm always impressed on the whole with the audience because there's so much potential for an audience member to, to can, can we swear on this panel? I usually swear, I'll, I'll tone it down. To, to mess with the show, uh, and they don't usually, like by and large, it's amazing how well-behaved people are at most immersive theater pieces, or, and, and, also, and also I will say, the mechanisms that the productions have in place to like allow for that, I find that fascinating. And in VR, there's this question of like, well, what if, what if there's a key plot point and the viewer like looks away? And I, I guess I've never thought that it's that complicated because when you go to the, movies, you know, there's gonna be an asshole that's talking on his phone or texting or like not paying attention. Like people always have the option of being assholes and like not engaging with this experience the way that its creators intended to. And like, you know, screw those people. Like most people will play ball with whatever you're trying to, to get them to experience. That's the point of putting on the headset or buying the ticket. Um, so I think like let the audience be, let, the, let the audience be. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, I I've thought about this a lot. Um, thought about a lot in the context of fringe festivals, um, which I've done some some research on. And fringe festivals are are sort of DIY, uh, mostly theater, performing arts festivals, and they're popping up everywhere and within the last 10 years or so. While that's happening, think about the amount of content that's been generated and put onto YouTube in the last 10 years. Think about the number of people who've posted on social media and written poems or written stories or essays and put them up for all these people to see. So I think we're seeing something happening in, in human culture where I can't say if it's that we had an impulse, so we created the tools, or if we created these tools and they unleashed these impulses for people to create. And so many more people have the capacity to create in some way and to then share with many, many people what they're creating. Um, and I think, that that's, I think that that's why immersive theater is booming in the way it is because we're, we're tapping into this shared impulse that we're all feeling like we're, we're itching to get something out in the world. Yeah, I also think that immersive theater really makes the audience feel valued. I mean, who doesn't want to like feel listened to and paid attention to and heard? That's like a primal human need. And I think uh, in a lot of the best shows I've seen, I feel incredibly seen by the performers and incredibly essential to the piece. Um, and I think that feeds a deep well that's inside all of us. Um, and, to, and on a technical level, to answer the second half of your question, we work on that in our shows by really engaging with a lot of eye contact with the audience. Um, touch is a part of the way we work with the audience. And like a really attentive listening and, and if we're not doing that, there's a reason. That's not all the time in every piece, but we use those tools. Um, and we also ask the audience to vocally participate, to speak, to give answers. Um, so I love that part of it. Um, but I've also been in shows, you know, in Sleep No More, no one paid attention to me at all. But I did love that if I got annoyed or mad, I could move on to another room or another experience. And that's a different kind of agency. And that is a different kind of value. It, yeah, it created for me a kind of a truculent relationship to that piece. Where I was like, well, fine, I'm running to a different room. Um, 
but that's cool too, that that's, there's a space for that. It's interesting to create a piece that feels like real life in that way. And in fact, maybe because it's a piece, I'm a little bolder and a little more aggressive than I'd be in real life. Um, it's a safe space to explore different emotional impulses as an audience member, so, yeah. And Charlie, can you uh, talk to that on, on your end as kind of having a space in a venue and, and curating and, and producing work for, for that? What, what do you find in your audience? Is there, is there an uptick in, in this desire for agency? Was it always there and there just weren't as many forms uh, acknowledging it? Um, well, I can say one thing, which is early on when we were experimenting, um, you learn pretty quickly that if you don't set up the right rules of engagement, it can be a total disaster because people expect a different amount of agency than you're willing to give them. And when you're not prepared for that, it can be really interesting um, and probably problematic for the art. Um, so I think, I think every artist working in this space discovers how to manipulate and control audiences so that it has the right amount of agency and it's comfortable for everyone because if that's out of alignment it can be uncomfortable and and potentially dangerous um i think that uh the <coughs> sorry now i've just forgotten the first part of what you asked me um ju just the when you're dealing with these people well, you mentioned your rules of engagement mm -hmm. when you I, I mean more from the audience perspective at this oh. point. What is it they're looking, like what is this hunger right. for agency? Where um, is it coming from? How do you then use your techniques to, to kind of right. exploit that to a way that's fully satisfied? So I think that um, I have a theory that social media and our increasingly mediated lives create a sense of need for authentic human interaction and that this type of work provides that. Um, and that's about the eye contact and the touch. And it's also about having an experience that no one else can have, because when you go through a piece like this, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or whether it's a group experience where so many things are happening simultaneously that you can't see the same show that everyone else does, yeah. it is unique to you and that is really special. Um, and then I think the other thing that I wanted to say, sorry, I'm, my brain is working faster than my mouth and then it doesn't catch up. Um, is that, uh, oh shoot, what was I gonna say? Agency, um, oh, the, the research that we've done, which has been funded by the Wallace Foundation, has, uh, as we've done a range of different types of work, has, has actually revealed that agency is less important to audience members as story is. And if they're not, if there's not a clear story that you can really latch on to, and we've had work that has been arranged, something with a very clear narrative and something that was much more episodic and not, didn't hold together in the same way. People immediately disliked, uh, on the whole, um, the lack of narrative. And so I would argue, based on my own experience and, and some of the feedback that we've heard from a lot of audiences at this point, that story um, is the most important thing. And agency is a, is a bonus, but is not the be all and the end all when it comes to these types of experiences. I, and that is a thousand percent true in VR as well. There's, a, there's an interesting article by David Brooks in the New York Times. It's a rapper performance with a Taylor Swift performance and he quote, he quote unquote, um, he quote unquote, uh, Lionel Trilling, where he said, in a society that's dominated by distrust, what people crave is authenticity. Um, and uh, it went on to say that, you know, what people crave in it. <laughs> just, just in a feed, trusting feed society. me one word at a time and I'll just <laughs> rally. What, what people crave in a trusting society is a sincerity. sincerity. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, what they crave is sincerity, but I think what I'm hearing here, because I'm, I'm in, I've come from it from film, but there are a number of people here who are on, in immersive theater, and there is a, what I, from what I have gathered in the last hour and a half of speaking to people, is that there is a, there is a great community here, and I think that with these new advents in technology, be it te television, film, radio, da da da, there is a kind of 
utopian impulse behind it um, and um, a kind of optimism behind it, and that's very exciting. Um, and I think that people who are making work that emphasize intimacy and authenticity and sincerity um, should be supported. Um, I also think that this technology is very powerful. Um, you know, I'm talking about VR now. Um, and uh, people in, in this theater piece that I'm about to do tonight, I think there's a lot of vulnerability that's involved. And I think when people put on a headset that you are tasked with um, treating that person with a greater deal of respect or at least openness to their own experience. So the, in, and I'll just speak to my own piece, but the pace of the, the film is such that it allows you to have room in the story and it allows you to kind of draw your own conclusions. Some of my favorite films are just films where you're observing and being someplace uh, that gives you a kind of respect to kind of have your own experience with respect to the piece that's playing. So I think there is some unity here between the immersive arts where you're looking at the audience member as a contributor in some way, or at least someone whom can, who can develop their own perspective on what's going on. Um, and I, I, I think that before VR becomes like everything else or like 90% Five percent of everything else. I want artists to kind of come at it with um, a little bit more hopefulness about what this can do for not only artistic experience but communication and how we interact with one another. So, there's a real quick. There's another thing that you just said that also points to the commonality across this whole panel, which is the uh, w when you put on a VR headset. That's it. You are watching that, you are experiencing that film, period. You're not checking your phone, et cetera, et cetera. And that's also true of almost all immersive theater kind of demands that you just be there. And that is becoming unusual. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of movie theaters are, are tamping down and trying to demand sort of a similar closed experience, which is great. but. Let's face it, we experience so much storytelling now on our TVs, you know, like this. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm watching this show, you know. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's awesome uh, across all of these forms of storytelling we're talking about. And also, um, you know, a, a barrier. There's a lot of people that are sort of like, whoa, like, I don't want to, like, commit to this thing. Um, that's my thought. Just one other similarity that I've been thinking about is that, I mean, immersive theater is not new. Environmental theater, site-specific, is stuff that has been around forever. Um, but it, immersive theater, as it's currently called, is a relatively new form and has taken on many different um, flavors, I would say, in the past 10 years especially. And VR obviously is, is a, a relatively new art form as well. And I think there is this spirit of experimentation and kind of every project, th there are no best practices yet in any of it. And, and a sense, I think, with the artists working in the forms that there aren't rules that you need to follow and that you can try new things and push the boundaries because the, the boundaries are pretty, um, poorly defined at this point and that there is so much crossover between different types of technology and different types of performance and different types of storytelling. And I think that that's really exciting. And, and all of the artists that I've met in, in both of these spaces, I think, share that sort of pioneer mentality of, you know, we're on the forefront trying new things and we're all in it together even though we're doing completely different things. I do think that there is, um, because because VR in particular, or like immersive theater, there's such broad categories. Um, you know, VR is games, it's therapy, um, hopefully increasingly it's storytelling, um, et cetera. Um, it draws on so many artistic disciplines that immersive theater or uh, theater actors and performing artists and film directors and novelists are now contending with what is the form of this new medium, which I will just call it spatial media. It's just, it's released from the screen, it's released from physicality, it's like, it's just in three dimensions around you. 
orally and, and, vice, and visually. So, so to kind of think about that abstractly, yes, you have film, that's one way. You have voiceover, you have audible books, you have recipes, you have, you know, you have dance, you have immersive theater. So people do come at it from very, very different perspectives, but it does kind of set itself up as this kind of meta media, you know, um, or a, a thing with which you can do a lot of different things. And it's, it's really great to be relevant. Relevant, <laughs> that was so crazy. Um, it's, it's good to be relevant across a number of different art, art forms, so. Uh, I wanna to expand on that and then address some of what uh, you were talking about a little bit earlier in terms of interacting with your audience. Um, I wanna ask, and we'll start with the theater folks and then move out to the outer rim of virtual reality here. The, um, what is your responsibility in either producing uh, or creating a show? Uh, what is your responsibility to the audience when you are putting something on that is, it, it's no longer somebody looking at a screen or looking at a stage. They're now in this show there can be a very substantial emotional response, especially when you are creating a feeling of intimacy. Uh, wh what is your responsibility to your audience and to your performers and crew when putting this show on? Uh, oh, okay, I'm gonna try this one. Um, physical safety, obvious but important to say. I know you're happy I'm saying it, you're gonna say it. Um, as a producer, she's happy I said it. Um, physical safety, definitely, for audience and for performer. Emotional, un I would say emotional unsafety, but within a deeper, like something is safe below that. So what I mean by that is, if you've made the, if the audience trusts you, and the actors trust you, Actually, let me say it sequentially. As the director, I have to create a space where the actors trust me, and then out of that grows the space where the audience trusts us when they show up, because things have been made clear, they are physically safe, and they can feel that we know what we're doing. And out of all of that safe container, we can create a piece that is emotionally not safe, or at least emotionally interesting, or emotionally evocative. And I think we do owe the audience something unique, something alive and exciting. That is also something we owe the audience inside of that ultimately safe container where they know they're gonna get home and it's gonna be okay. Um, you know, some of our pieces ask less of the audience and those, those are one kind of thing we do. And, but then like Red Flags, for example, the piece we have here is asking a lot more of the audience. And in fact, the line, the edge of the piece is blurred as the participant in the piece, you never interact with anybody besides the main character of the piece. There's no box office to check into. There's, there's no, there's a phone number you can call that you can add, like if, if you, you're confused, you need help with your ticket, like you can get in touch with somebody, but the person you're ostensibly getting in touch with is the character you're going on the date with. So for us, we were really trying to go right to the edge of reality and say, what's the least like a piece of theater this can feel and it still feel safe ultimately? And that's a line we're exploring all the time. Um, and for most of, I would say for 95% of the audiences who have done Red Flags, it's totally clear and they enjoy it. And then for maybe like one to 3%, there was confusion that we sort of worked through with them afterwards about how real or not real the piece was. But that's the, that, that's the minority. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're experimenting with it. Yeah, I would say uh, from a producing perspective, the thing that I'm always conscious of is how do we set audience expectations in a healthy way and in a, a way that, that starts to convey that sense of trust uh, from the, even from, with the marketing of a show that we're, we're marketing it correctly, that we're using the right adjectives that convey what type of experience it will be. Because what we've really learned is immersive theater is not for every audience member. And if you get an audience member who doesn't wanna be there, it's really bad for everybody. It hurts other people's experience, they don't have a good time, the actors feel it. Uh, it's much, it, you can't, it, you know, if you were sitting in the back row of this panel and didn't want to be here, you could walk out and we'd all be okay, no, no harm, no foul. It's very different uh, when you're in the middle of a dinner party for 12 people and you leave bad. Um, so I try to make sure that our marketing is very much in line with what the actual product is. 
and that we are set, and, and that any rules that people need to know that are so important that they need to know ahead of time, we're communicating those from the get-go. Um, the, yeah. the process of getting the audience from their arrival to understand the rules of the piece is called onboarding in the community. Um, it's like, I think it's a term from Imagineering and theme park rides. Um, I'm not totally <clears> sure though. Uh, so the question of how to onboard the audience is one we always ask. When they arrive, who greets them? Is that person in character or in world? Or are they out of character or out of world? Um, how do we convey or communicate any rules for the night? Um, a general good principle to follow if you're going to make this work is to try to come up with as few rules as possible for the audience to follow. Just the simplest, simplest set of rules. Um, so that you're not sitting there listing, like, I've gone to some shows and have had people read, like, all of the things rules. I can't do. And I'm like, well, this is a terrible way to be invited into an experience. <laughs> Just a bunch of stuff I can't do. So yeah. uh, the, you've got to be artful about it. But you do have to also onboard them effectively. Which is one of the reasons why in our work so far, we've played a lot with these social scripts. And, you know, Charlie was saying at the Wild Party, people are the guests at a party. And, and that's, that's a role we know how to play as people, and so we found it really helpful to start from a role that people understand really well. Well, we all have been on a date, we know how that kind of goes, and, and then you're using people's sort of social expectations to your advantage, and you're also communicating to them, you should probably behave like you're on a date and be respectful of this person. The, the last thing I'll add, and I think everything you said is brilliant and I totally agree, is, um, the element of surprise, and this is more for the audience, but what is so special about this work is that um, it, it can't completely surprise you, and, and this is actually a technique we learned from Third Rail Projects who um, created Sweet and Lucky with us, and they're real experts in this, but you know, we released six photographs of the whole show and no video, mm -hmm. and we didn't talk about the plot at all, we just talked about the audience's experience, so there's very little out there to discover and spoil that after you go into this antique store, you're gonna walk into a funeral where it rains on you. And there were so many surprises built into that show that could be authentic surprises for people that weren't spoiled unless a stupid reviewer mentioned it, um, which you can't control. But um, I think that that element of surprise is part of what makes this work so exciting and doing everything we can to preserve that and, and you, you know, prepare people for the experience but also you know, not give away too much is really important. I have one final thought. Yeah, go ahead. I have one more thought, uh, which is that something I think about a lot, we talk about a lot, is um, you really do, in this type of work, you have the power to manipulate people and I've gotten very frustrated in, in some theater that I, immersive theater I've seen, where I felt like uh, what was asked of me emotionally wasn't earned, and that I was, I was put in a vulnerable place, and, and the, the show didn't, didn't earn my trust before they asked me to, to do something that was very hard uh, and challenging emotionally. So. That's definitely a line and something that, that I think all people working in this form engage with of it's the whole with great power comes great responsibility thing. And it's, it's something that I think that the, the peers that we really respect are doing really well, that they're very conscious of that. Then moving on to, to you guys, your responsibility you feel to your audience when creating it. Uh, piece, be it either technological limitations or what their expectation is there, uh, but also how they're engaging with your content. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of times you're trying to make something. You're, yeah. um, in my case, I feel like often I'm, I'm fighting against something. Um, and the thing that I think I'm fighting against is, uh, is that kind of manipulation or that, that purely engineered form of entertainment or, or engagement where you are expected to feel a certain way and manipulated to feel a certain way about a character because we've done it before, we've done it 70 times and we kind of know how this story is gonna go and we know that like inevitably because that actor is so un unbelievably charming that yet yeah, I'll fall for it again. And 
I think that there's a much better way to engage. It just feels like that's just being broadcast from a, from a tower, a rich tower on the, on the hill side, whereas what the kind of thing that I think is really interesting and the thing that we're all striving for is to develop a bit more of a dialogue with the audience member rather than this kind of Hitchcock kind of, I want to pull the livers and just have someone feel this emotion and then that emotion just give some space to that and allow the audience to shape our experience. And I think that's super, super exciting and also super vital, just, just vital in our culture to have that kind of, that kind of relationship between artists and audiences. Yeah, the, in the VR world, this is, this is interesting because um, there's a, so, so my, when it comes to movies, uh, you know, uh, flatties, we know we call them flatties now in, in the VR world, regular movies. Um, my my tastes run pretty hard to what you would call, you know, the, the art house. Um, my favorite movie of this past year was a ghost war, uh, a ghost story, almost said a ghost world, which I also love, which is a movie that is way too slow for most people um, and is not gonna, you know, make a ton of money or anything like that. Um, and in VR, we have this weird sort of imperative at the moment to do everything we can to encourage adoption because it's this emerging artistic medium and also this emerging sort of market that hasn't figured out yet how to pay for itself. And so I love seeing VR pieces and there are many of them out there, including here at this festival, that are you know, really engaging and, and, and asking big questions, but that exist more within, in the flatty world, what you would call sort of the art house space. And then you have this idea of what's going to make, um, you know, a, a mom in, you know, middle America want to go out and buy a VR headset and help encourage this whole world to take off. And that is, for lack of a better way to put it, just shit that's just really entertaining. And that's kind of, I think, I think Dark Corner as a, as a library is, is taking a little bit the middle ground, but more leaning towards just being, above all else, just being as entertaining as possible. You know, we, um, Night Night is, is five minutes long, and it's just it's this very sort of accessible sort of horror thrill ride. And I think that both of those tracks, uh, you know, I would never want to live in a world where there's both don't exist. But in VR at this moment, there's this sort of, uh, necessity for things that are just like fun and entertaining and sort of feel like watching a traditional movie that you would go to on a Friday night and you're just gonna have a fun time with your friends because that's what most people expect when they go to the movies and we need VR to sort of you know give that so that people buy more headsets. Uh, I want to make sure we have time for a few questions so uh, does anybody just put up your hand does anybody have a question we can ask? Yes. Uh, in terms of VR, I'm curious about distribution. Uh, having worked in VR 20 some years ago, you know, as a content creator, and the only other people that ever saw your work were other content, content creators or developers, you know, you're kind of a slave to either iFix or Apple or Microsoft. I'm wondering how you see Facebook and its ability to display VR. Or do you see this as more an installation like you guys have here where it's, you're relegated to somebody wearing a headset and experiencing it just as a solo person? Yeah, uh, that, that is the, you know, billion dollar question. Um, the, a, the fact is a lot of VR content gets experienced right now as what's better called 360 video. You know, if you are on Facebook or YouTube and you can scroll with the mouse and move where you are, like that's, that's a way to watch these experiences. And I, I think it helps because it's an entree. It's, it's that little light bulb going off for a lot of people for the first time. Like, wait, I can, there's a 360 space here? That's cool, I wanna know more. Um, that being said, we are, you know, understandably, <laughs> hard proponents of like, no, you should be in a headset, you should, you know, exist only in this world. Um, and to the question of distribution, I can't help but uh, plug the new Dark Corner platform that just launched literally last month at the same time that we first started showing Night Night. Um, 
There's, you can get the Dark Corner app on your phone, or if you have a Gear VR headset, basically anywhere that VR now can be accessed. And that's, you know, it's sort of like a miniature uh, Netflix within that space, and you can choose which experience to watch. And that is, um, for a lot of people, the future of VR distribution. Um, it, there's also a big movement at the minute towards location-based experiences, not like here at film festivals, but you know, um, like in Los Angeles, there's a couple of them now, but like the IMAX Center was one that opened where you pay, you know, 20 bucks and you get to go experience a bunch of VR. You don't have to own a headset just for two hours like a movie. And there's, there's this interesting sort of pair of question marks of like, which one is gonna work? We don't know, we're trying both. And I think probably both of them will persist for a while. Um, but we certainly think that there's enough there are enough people that are buying headsets and you know the graphs don't look like what everybody said they would look like two years ago, which was insane, but they're still going up in terms of uh, people buying headsets and checking this out and starting to get interested. So um, we think it'll work. Buy Dark Corner. <laughs> Anything you want um, as, a, as an independent creator of work that's not doing a platform, you have many options. I mean, I think the, um, I don't know why I thought that there's the, the first objection to the Model T was Henry, but there are no roads. Um, I think we have all the roads, we just don't have the content yet. You know, it's like there, there are people who are producing things, but it's, um, it's like the early days of film. It's one shot, it's here, it's not, it's not sort of complicated in any way. So I think once the content, um, and, and this is a, a chicken and egg or a bootstrapping problem, once the content gets interesting, I think people will, or, or there's more content that's interesting, I think people will start to adopt and we're seeing a kind of slow, slow trickle in of that sort of stuff. It's not, it's not the meteoric rise that everyone expected because there are companies like Google uh, spending you know, m hundreds of millions of dollars on Magic Leap, which hasn't announced yet, and, and YouTube and its Tango platform, and Facebook has bought Oculus for $2 billion, and uh, there's Within, there's, uh, there are independent platforms, there's Jaunt, uh, Auto would be coming out on Jaunt next week, so like that, that's coming out on 360 video, on an app on your phone, um, HTC Vive. But again, what he says is, there's such a multitude of ways to get your content out there. Um, it just depends on what you're making. Um, so if you're making 360 video, you, there's very little money, uh, I would say, uh, for, for people who are producing content. So that does put a ceiling on production value and what you can expect. But there are many ways to get it out there for the people who will watch it. Um, I think that in the US, you know, if you're talking like a set-top bot, or you're, you're basically like an Oculus Rift or an HTC Vive, um, that's a $1,600 proposition, whereas in China, um, they have a more of an arcade model uh, where you rent time. Um, so culturally, it's more prepared in China, and it's doing a lot better. Um, also, there's a big mobile culture um, that supports VR, um, and I think um, so culturally, I think we're going to lag behind in viewership, um, but we'll find out what it is. You know, there's a five-story thing now in the Empire State Building that's a VR arcade, so this is an arcade model. Um, there are cinemas that are going to be opening up, uh, mostly in China, but where it's like, or in LA, you know, like you can kind of cue, you can have a theatrical experience um, where you're watching the same program of 30 minutes with... <laughs> 30 other people in the same room at the same time. So it's like being in a theater. Um, and then hopefully as long form content comes out, uh, it can be experienced. Um, you know, I don't think anytime soon people will be having headsets on for two and, you know, two and a half hours or three hours in, in a room, but people can consume these things like a novel at home. You know, and you're sort of experiencing the first chapter in a story and you're going through your own pace or things get announced to you. So again, it's like, I think that if you have a piece, if you have, an, if you have something that you want to do um, for any like 360 video and that sort of thing, you can find, find a way to distribute it. Uh, but then again, these things tend to change form, so often you have to build your own platform or you have to build your own experience. So it's, uh, it's easy if it's 360 video, and if it gets more complicated than that, then you have to get more complicated. We have time for one or two more questions. Yeah.
Uh, so if, uh, the question was in VR, for those of you who are from traditional filmmaking backgrounds, what does the transition look like between making traditional films and VR films? Is that fair? Is that a fair summary? Okay. Um, well, I think that a lot of things translate. Um, you know, you have a camera crew, you have to get craft services, you have to shut down locations, you have to raise money and write contracts and have a cinematographer and do camera tests and all of that sort of stuff. So inform, uh, you know, you have that, you have a production schedule and, you, you know, you're shooting for four days and da da da. But the cam you know, once you bring in the camera, things get a little more difficult. Um, one, you have to comp out the camera rig if you want to maintain a sense of, um, you know, that, that the world is not a film set. You have to remove the, the camera rig itself. Um, you're filming everything around most of the time, so you have to hide your crew. You have to consider the, the shot. You know, the shot, the frame, is the position, you know, so it's... so. Um, I think that people kind of, I think at first people were like, well, what does the director do in VR? What is it, why do you need a director? And I'm like, well, well, you have to tell a story. You have to set a, you have to set the position of where the, you have to, and I wanted to say this earlier, it's like, it's not so much, every one of, you know, from immersive theater to uh, first person point of view, you have to characterize the viewer in some way. And you have to, you have to allow, you have to set the rules, you have to onboard this person, you have to set the rules of engagement, which is very different from a, from a film, because you don't, I mean, auto is a film. It, it like very much like want, it, it wants to treat you as if you're watching a film. So like those rules of engagement are very simple. Um, but um, it's, in a word, it's a lot more complicated um, because you're dealing with stitching and technology, um, and it's a much more choreographed experience because um, you don't, you can't do traditional coverage, for example. You know, if I was doing a dinner scene, I would film a master shot and a shot reverse shot and some close-ups and a two shot or, and then you have, and then some inserts, and then you have a, an array of choices in the edit room to choose what's going to happen. Whereas this, in auto, I mean, you can only speak for the piece, it's like, it's a series of theatrical pieces. Um, but it is fluid and the, and the action is continuous, so I am cutting in the same way that a, a film cuts, but you cut differently um, because you have to cut con whole contexts, not just, not just a, a frame here and there. So there's a very instructive diagram called The Hero's Journey, which was done by Jess Brilhart, who was the resident filmmaker at Google. And because you're, when in VR, you're not doing a frame in time, you're doing a sphere, you're doing spheres. So when I cut from one sphere around your head to the next, if I cut on a place where your attention, it's, if, I, if I have an actor and the, an actor goes screen left and m your attention is here, and then when I cut out, which I remove that sphere and replace it with another one, if, n if my attention isn't there, then it's disorienting. And I have to find my bearings again in this new environment. But if I cut, if the character is going this way, and I cut there, and in the next shot, my attention is exactly there, then that can move around. So it's very much, you have to, it's not so much you're cutting on it, you're, you're cutting on attention, really, um, in this case. So. But a lot of things translate, but again, I mean, you know, I could go on for 15 minutes about this. Like, it's, it, there's, there are a lot of differences in how you do it. But in my case, I would just say there's a much more choreography. Our edit took 36 hours, basically, because everything, this shot had to, you're just choosing the best take, the best performance, and then you're cutting exactly as you'd sort of planned. So, I don't know. I, I want to throw in one more thing here because I've also worked, I went from 2D to 3D video. I've done a little 360 video myself. And the casting is really the thing I would underline because you need people who have film experience but actually are theater actors at their core because you do just get the single take. Uh, and I, so I would say in the audition and casting process, there's a difference and you need to spend, you need, I would say, even a more rigorous casting process. 
I mean, people who you feel like can just sustain and stay in that and keep and have an internal sense of pacing themselves. People who, actors who can carry story and are almost have a little bit of director brain themselves. I think that's also very important. So totally agree with that. Just, just double down on, yeah, on that down. Yeah. hardcore. Um, I know there's a lot more that we could talk about with, with kind of all of these. There's just a range of topics and subtopics that we could talk about within this, but we only have time for one more question. So if anybody would like to take it. Oh, yes. Didn't see in the light. Sorry about that. Um, just sort of, you sort of said the novelty of it. How do we take the story and connecting with the emotion and take the VR experience past the novelty of a first date or a tour through an asylum or something like that? How do we make it appealing to that next level of audience to more than just the people that are going to the art house films or coming to an event like this? That's, that's a great question. I'd love to expand that to it, just interactive in general. Yeah, and I want to answer right away because I've been like wanting to talk about that study that you mentioned since you brought it up. The answer is story. The answer is story. Like, it's no longer just interesting that we have VR or that we have immersive theater. That the form is not interesting. It's what you're saying in it. And I think a well-told story, and it doesn't have to be, I wouldn't create the story thinking, how do I appeal to a broad audience? I think all great art is probably made from a space of, I appealed to a very specific audience and then it ironically ended up going wide and blowing up. Um, so that's how I would approach it. I would still keep it specific, but I would use like, you know, the sort of traditional storytelling principles, beginning, middle, and end, something needs to change. Like I have a goal and I met an obstacle and I overcame it or I didn't, and I failed. Like those sort of like archetypal human storytelling uh, principles and formats, that's where I would go. And I would just, I just want everyone to start trying to tell better, stronger stories in these mediums. And I think that's how we'll break out. I just want to throw, uh, I'm going to put on my twirly mustache and just bring up uh, sort of the elephant in the room, which is you need to, to find ways for more people to experience it. And that's something we struggle with a lot in immersive theater. If there's um, this concept called throughput, which is how many people you can send through an experience in a, you know, a show in a day, a night. And how do you how do you increase throughput while also maintaining the things that make these forms our intimacy connection often? Uh, I don't have an answer, but but that's that's the question. I don't know. Sorry, not an answer. No, just a reframing. Of. I think uh, I think I think we, I think we would all just uh, again the the story is, is the answer. Um, it, it has to be. Uh, great storytelling and also, um, in the case of VR specifically, I suppose, production value plays a big role and that does come back to casting, especially the more that we can make VR experiences feel like, like we're accustomed when we go to a movie theater to a certain level of just sort of quality that we see on screen, like that doesn't look like something you would see on YouTube. And there's, VR exists in a weird space because it does exist on your computer a lot, and so um, I think the more that we can have people put on a headset and, and sort of say to themselves, like, oh, this feels like a movie, and that includes getting um, name talent to talk about casting to be involved, and, 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 and also, you know, theater actors are absolutely the way to go, uh, because you have to, you have to have, you have to believe what you're seeing, and in order to feel truly immersed, it has to be, it has to be well produced. Um, and that, unfortunately, is where money comes back in, and then we need more people to buy headsets, and that whole ball starts rolling again. Uh, any final thoughts? I have one thought, which is, there is a question that happens, and it happened at the beginning, and this is a great, it was a great question, but I think a lot of producers and a lot of, uh, and a lot of studios say, well, why does, it, why does it have to be in VR? You know, like, if it's not absolutely perfect for the medium, we can't tell it. And so then it just has to, the, the subject and the content has to just obsess about how, how it is in VR and like, what does it mean in VR? No one would have said to Shakespeare, like, why do you want to tell this like super obscure historical story about a prince, you know, that 
and and that's you could just do it in a book, really. You know, it's like we've we've got the print, you know, printing press is coming around here, so we've got that. So I think that there needs to be some laxity around like the criteria and just focus on: is this a good story? Can we do it? And when the market, if the market catches up, then maybe you don't need such a hard justification for doing it in VR. Um, so I just I think it I think it squelches a lot of creativity and it just like immediately cuts shuts a lot of ideas down. So uh, anything to add to close this out? I think the last element that no one has said is time. That these are still early days, especially for VR. And so, you know, if you think about where cinema was at the end of the 1800s, as it was just starting, it was pretty basic. Uh, in terms of what people could do and, and how audiences could wrap their heads around it. And it took, you know, it took a, a good couple of decades before the form really settled into its own and audiences came around to understanding their relationship with it. And, and so I think we have to expect that it's gonna take another 10 years before we get to a place where it's, it's widely understood by everyone. But I do think that will come fast. Like within eight, 10 years of the advent of film, there were like 8,000 theaters in the US. They were makeshift, but it was, it became, I mean, I think we're, I have some hope. And with that, uh, I'd love to thank all of our panelists uh, for joining us this evening. So thank you so much. Uh, if you would like to experience uh, some of the virtual reality, we have a number of curated and sponsored programs down one floor below, including uh, work from these two uh, that'll be running all week long. Uh, please check out the Off Center program at the Denver uh, Center for Performing Arts to see future work. Uh, Capital W is mostly based in Los Angeles, but there is a, a, a community of immersive artists uh, both there and abroad, and uh, there is a Facebook group called Everything Immersive, which is a great way to learn about upcoming work. And we referenced uh, a show called Sleep No More A Lot. That, for those who don't know, is a show in New York that uh, uh, has become wildly popular and inspired a number of modern day immersive artists. Uh, so there are plenty of ways to learn more about all of these forms. Thank you much, so much for coming out. And uh, well, there's another panel in here tonight. There'll be a number of panels here tomorrow. Please check out the rest of uh, what the Denver Film Festival has to offer. Just hand it to someone. Who did it? Who did it? Hey, do you mind asking a question?